Hello, everyone. I am Ed Pegg Jr., and this is episode two of Mathematical Games. Um, Martin Gardner in the uh, 60s started uh, Mathematical Games, and it was a very popular column for 25 years in Scientific American. And it was very influ influential on both me and uh, many other mathematicians. So this series is kind of in the, the, uh, the realm of those columns that Martin Gardner used to do. And today I'm going to be talking about fractions. But first, um, a little bit intro on the demonstrations project. In particular, this demonstration, which I wrote uh, a number of years ago on Pentagon tilings, which was based on Martin Gardner's column on Pentagon tilings. It turns out 100 years ago today, Marjorie Rice was born. She was a, a housewife with no mathematical training who saw Martin Gardner's column on Pentagon tilings, uh, which I'll go into here. So here's a bit of code from my demonstration. And Martin Gardner started out his column with the five types of pentagons cataloged by Carl Reinhardt in the early part of the last century. And he found these five infinite families and basically said that that's all the possible ways you can tile with pentagons. But in the in the uh, 70s, Richard Kirchner found three more. And he said, Reinhardt was wrong about that being all the pentagons. Here's these three more. But I'm pretty sure this is now all the possible ways of tiling with pentagons. And Marjorie Rice uh, loved this, this column. And for some reason, I can't scroll down anymore. Uh, she said, uh, I became fascinated by the subject. And she found, oh, I need to go out of. For some reason, I can't scroll down here. Ah, let's go back here. Sorry about that. I thought I'd put something further down. So, Marjorie Rass find, found these four ways of, of tiling the plane with pentagons. And more than anyone else, she found more than one quarter of all possible ways of tiling with pentagons. So um, both uh, Kirshner and Reinhardt were wrong. Marjorie Rice found a whole bunch more. And it turned out there was two others that were found, the last one uh, just uh, eight years ago by, uh, by uh, Casey and Mann. So a uh, bit of historical, 100 years ago, Marjorie Rice was born. For fractions, there's basically these four common ways of indicating fractions with horizontal bar, virgural diagonals, and uh, some fractions are actually built right into Unicode. These are usually called either vulgar or common fractions, and the vulgar means that it's commonplace. And here are the various fraction formulas that we all learn in, in grade school. Uh, you can add them, you can subtract, you can multiply and divide. But there's another function that isn't taught, and that is the median, where basically you add the numerators and add the denominators. This is also a very useful thing to do with fractions, as we shall see. A sequence of, of fractions, of reduced fractions, is often called the fairy sequence. So for example, here order six, here are all the fractions with a denominator six or less, 
where everything is reduced. So you don't see two over six here because that's already one third. So these are the, the ferry fractions from zero to one. It turns out if you take the medians of these, you get numbers that are in are that are higher up in the ferry sequence. But if you do the median again, you get back the original fractions. And that's a, a property of the ferry sequence when you just list fractions in order. One thing often done involving fractions is the greatest common denominator. This is one of the oldest algorithms. And a simple way of doing it is just to take a rectangle. Um, so for if you want the greatest common divisor of seven and four, just make a seven by four rectangle, put in the largest possible square over and over again. And the size of the last square is the greatest common denominator. So for example, for eight and six, the largest square you get is of size two. So the greatest common denominator is two. And this algorithm is very fast. And this is basically how it works. Just keeping, just tossing things out until there's just a small part left and then you're done. Also at the time of Euclid, the Egyptians were also working with fractions, but they only allowed fractions if they had a one on top. So you could have the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and you could have one over two, one over three, one over four, one over five, one over six, one over seven. And with these fractions, they could sum them up to get any number. So I don't know if the Egyptians ever, ever did this particular one. They get uh, pretty hairy quickly. So 77 over 1,090, you can represent with these three Egyptian fractions. And one question you might ask is, how many fractions are needed for a given number? Well, it turns out that's unsolved. Uh, Erdos noticed that the numbers with four on top could always be represented with three fractions. And Seer Pensky noticed three fractions were always noticed for anything with a five on top. Well, it turns out that whether this is always possible is still unsolved. Uh, for example, four over, four over 74 has 32 solutions, five over 74 has 60 solutions, but whether it's, there's always a solution with three Egyptian uh, fractions is still unsolved to this day. So even though this is a really old problem, it still has portions which are unsolved. So not everything about fractions is known. A common thing for, for uh, messy fractions is to split them up with uh, decomposition. And that is done by factoring the lower number. And from that, you can get simpler fractions. So that's partial fraction decomposition. The slope of a line, which goes through a grid point, is a fraction. So here we have the the, the slopes of, of various lines. We can also take a series of fractions, for example, the Fairy sequence with uh, order four. These are the, the Fairy fractions for order four. If you Square the denominator and multiply by two and move up the center to get this point, you can draw a circle with the radius of one over two times the denominator squared, and you'll get this nested series of circles. So for 
the furry sequence, um, you have uh, one third and one half comes later. At order five, you have two fifths, which is uh, tangent to both one third and one half. Two fifths is the median of one third and one half. Three sevenths here is the median of two fifths and one half. Uh, each of these infinite circles down here are part of a lower rank in the Fairy sequence, and the tangent circles are always are are always found by taking the medians of the two higher fractions. So there's a uh, there's the start of the Fairy sequence at order four. The median triangles are are the median circles have these as the driving uh, positions for for the where they would go. Uh, fractions are are so useful with with circles that they usually will if it's a, if it's an Egyptian fraction one over something uh, they will usually take the reciprocal and call it the bend. So, for example, the circle with radius one third is said to have a bend of three. And that's measuring from the outside. If you're measuring from the inside of a circle, you consider that curvature of one over the radius as negative. One thing we can take a look at is what are the possible bends for the Ford circles? Well, we're always squaring the the denominator and then multiplying by two. So basically it's two times the squares and mod two, there's only four possible values that you can get. And that leads into the Descartes circle theorem. With four mutually tangent circles, if you have the curvatures that are all bends, integer bends. So, so for example, uh, this is one half, one third, one sixth, one eleventh, one eighteenth, one twenty seventh, and so on. These big numbers here are the bends. Two corresponds to a uh, a radius of one half. Three corresponds to a radius of one third. Six corresponds to a radius of one sixth. If you add up, if you if you square those values, so this this circle on the outside has a curvature of minus one, and if you square those and take twice the total, you get one hundred. If you just sum them up first and square, you get one hundred. The total of these is uh, two plus three plus six minus one. 11 minus 1 is 10, 10 squared is 100. And similarly, 1 plus 4 plus 9 plus 36 is 50 times 2 is 100. And by the Descartes circle, circle theorem, if the, if the square of the curvatures times 2 is equal to the sum of the curvatures squared, those three, those four circles are tangent to each other. On the complex plane, you can take the centers and just multiply them together as, as so, and you get basically the same thing. So once you know where three circles are that are tangent, you can find the position and radius of the next circle. And that's what this, this function does, is it just takes a starter seed, for example, three, six, seven, and then everything else is generated automatically using uh, Rene Descartes' formula. And all of these uh, circles, mod 12, there's only four values. Modulus, modulus four, only four values can occur in e with each of these. Once the initial four values are laid out, for example, minus 6, 11, 14, 5, that gives a number of modulus values, uh, mod 12, 
and that's you're stuck with just those for all the infinite circles uh, that that follow. And so these are colored by the modulus uh, mod twelve. If you have a interior circle, for example, 198 here, the circles around it form a what's called a pompous chain. And the, the outer circle in each case has a negative value. For the Ford circle, Ford circles, that line at the bottom is a is a circle of curvature zero or a straight line. We can also enumerate fractions. And basically the simple way of, is just to make a grid of them uh, uh, with one at the bottom, one through 12, with two at the bottom, one through 12, and so on. And then you just zigzag back and forth. And this basically shows that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between all the fractions and the counting numbers. So Index 49 corresponds to rational fraction 9 fourth. However, this contains all of the fractions here, are, or most of the fractions here are improper. You have 1 over 1, which is valued, but 2 over 2, 3 over 3, 4 over 4, those are all equal to 1. Uh, 1 over 2, 2 over 4, 3 over 6, um, those are all improper fractions because you can reduce them. In fact, I don't know what this button does. So this, with this enumeration scheme, we can also show reduced fractions. But I haven't played with this, so I, I shouldn't talk about it too much. One way of enumerating, enumerating them so that nothing is repeated is to use the calc and wealth method. So once you have a fraction A over B, it has subfractions A over A plus B and A plus B over B. So for example, three halves here, you have three over three plus two and three plus two over two. One of the oddities of the Calc and Wolf method is that each numerator here or each uh, denominator here is the next numerator. Five five four four seven seven three three, and that also uh, carries over to the between rows. So this is actually three over one. Uh, so one is the denominator, one is the next numerator, and this uh, tree continues on forever. Another way is the stern brokot method, which is based on medians. So for example, to get three fourths you're basically between two thirds and one over one. Uh, two plus one is three, three plus one is four. And similarly, uh, between two thirds and three fourths, you have two plus three and three plus four are five sevenths. With both methods, the going from front to back is you you can uh, take the reciprocals and you get the sequence in reverse order. So for example, one over five, the reciprocal is five. Five fourths, the reciprocal is four fifths. So this, the reciprocal is the reverse this way. The stern brokot sequence, you have the same thing. And once you build up these trees, we take each layer in turn, you can get the enumerating, enumeration of the rac radicals by calc and wealth. So for example, the hundredth fraction is by calc and wealth is seven nineteenths. And if you plug in seven nineteenths, it's the one hundredth. Stern Brokot works similarly. But uh, since it's based on a method based on binary numbers, you can just put in any number and get that corresponding fraction. And when you plug in that fraction, you get back the index number. So everything is nicely indexed and it's very fast. The 
enumeration by calc and will starts like that uh, the numerators give what's called the fusc sequence f-u-s-c uh, because it's a, a confiscated uh, method for generating numbers and the stern brokat sequence begins like that and we can basically put in any integer and any any numerator or denominator and pull up the indices we can also use fractions within geometry methods so for example we can take a triangle and find a point and then calculate the percentage of of the triangle by each of the new generated by each of the new triangles generated by that point so this point generates three triangles with areas one sixth, one half, and one third of the original triangle. These uh, areas are considered to be signed areas. So if the point is outside, it turns out that this value here for this this triangle is actually one. It, it actually has a signed area of minus one sixth. And minus one six plus one half plus two thirds is one. You're always wanting to get a sum of one when you're working with Ariel or barycentric coordinates. Ariel and barycentric both basically mean the same thing. One way of representing all of these fractions is to multiply by the greatest common denominator, and that turns everything into integers nicely. So this point here, uh, which is basically uh, one half, one third, one sixth, that corresponds to integers three, two, one. And that's this point here. This, uh, this point is the same as the point above, divides the triangle into one half, one third, one sixth. And each of these points divides up the triangle in different ways. For example, this point here doesn't divide up the triangle at all, really. It's just the original triangle, and there's uh, zero, uh, uh, two zero area triangles that are degenerate. Once you have this series of integers representing the point, you can get the original fractions by dividing by their total. We could also do something like changing all of these fractions to generate a an RGB color. So here's a start at a color triangle. And here's a color tetrahedron. Very centric coordinates can work in any dimension. Here are the various uh, fractions representing values in a tetrahedron. So for example, this one is basically one half, one fourth, zero, one fourth is uh, one of the one of the um, fractions where you're dividing a tetrahedron into four parts. And you could basically skew either the triangles or the tetrahedra in any way the aerial coordinates don't care how skewed your triangle is. It's basically working based on the way it divides the triangle into three areas or the tetrahedron into four areas. I showed uh, this a few slides ago, and this is basically 18 lines of five points. And this was found using very centric coordinates. We can extend it with the, this code and you get a 3D version of this, which has a whole bunch of lines in three dimensions. Every single line here has five points. And this is all basically found with applying fractions. When you're working with Ariel or very center coordinates, you can also look at lines for example this here is the line one half 
one fourth one fourth. The point here, minus one, two, zero, if you multiply by the line, the dot product is zero. So a barycentric point such as that is on a barycentric line if the dot product is zero. And that makes these very easy to work with. Uh, every point corresponds to a line, every line corresponds to a, a, a point. But the canonical versions have three forms. They can either, a, a line can either have a sum totaling one, or it can have a sum totaling zero, which means it goes to the center, center point. And usually you, you want the last value to be one, and then a and minus one and minus a with a total zero. And that means it goes to the center point. And the, the, the toughest one to deal with is the vertical line through the center. And canonically, that has this value. But basically, you have 27 points and 27 lines here with this configuration, which actually is a self-dual four configuration. Every point, of course, goes through, uh, every point has four lines on it, and every line has four points. And also, uh, the points are the same as the lines. For example, this line here, 211, that means uh, all blue here means all the values are positive. That corresponds to this point here. This is the barycentric point, this is the barycentric line. For two zero one zero is always uh, neutral, so it's colored green. Uh, this line here three, the red corresponds to negative. So this is the very centric line three minus two one, and the point is over here. So this is a set of twenty seven points and lines where every point is a line and every line is a point. Whether there's another four configuration like this is unsolved. So how else can we represent fractions? We can use repeating decimals. So for any fraction, we can get a decimal version. And for any decimal, we can also get a a fraction so for example this repeating decimal corresponds to this fraction another thing we can do is use continued fractions so for example not sure why this isn't showing up well we can represent this series of repeating fractions with this periodic sequence. When it's a repeating series and a continued fraction, that means that a square root is involved or, or, or a third. Uh, not all uh, most rational numbers are, are most irrational numbers don't have a continued uh, Continue, uh, a, a repeating continued fraction. Usually it's more varied and random. For example, here's the continued fraction for pi. It starts out uh, three and then one seventh. Uh, 22 sevenths is a pretty good approximation for pi. And so is three, three, three over 106 is the next good approximation for phi. And quite a few people probably know this one as well, which is a excellent fraction for representing pi and each fraction here is better but usually most most people who want to remember these will stop at this because it's a nice uh, easy to remember fraction one one three three five five you just uh, two of each of the the first odd numbers and then you put the bigger set over the smaller set and that's very close to pi one odd thing about these random sequences generate giving uh, continued fractions is for almost any value the 
geometric mean of those terms goes to what's called the Kinchin constant. So for example, if we look at the first 200,000 terms of continued fraction of pi, the geometric mean is about 2.685. The Kinchin constant is 2.685 and so on. It's, uh, it's very weird how this works and it's still not quite understood. An exact value for the Kinchin constant is currently unknown. Some, uh, some numbers have large values early on. For example, uh, pi had 292. But if you look at the simple value, um, 9.1 to the fourth, you get this large value in the continued fraction. So it turns out that 33 over 19 is an excellent approximation for the fourth root of 9.1. It's uh, good for eight decimal places. Usually, that large value means that something weird is going on. So uh, 91 over 10 is a, to the one-fourth is approximately 33 over 19, which means if you take the, uh, uh, the fourth power of each side, it means that 91 over 10 is approximately 33 over 19 to the fourth. And if you multiply those out with the cross product, which is one of the one thing I thought was really neat uh, when working with fractions when I was in uh, grade school. If you look at the cross product, 91 times 19 to the fourth minus 10 times 33 to the fourth equals one. And if you multiply these out, you get these two large numbers, uh, 11,859,210, and one more than that. It turns out these are the largest two consecutive 19 smooth numbers, which means that they are, all their factors are less, or all their prime factors are 19 or less. And if you know what's, uh, what's known as the ABC conjecture, this is one of the best known examples for the ABC conjecture. And that's why the fourth root of 9.1 is weird because it's one of the most extreme values in what's known as the ABC conjecture. Uh, if you're playing with the continued fractions and you find something goes big, that means you're on to something. Um, uh, this is something I, I found just playing around with Mathematica. And it was so strange that I submitted it to the online encyclopedia of integer sequences. And a few months later, somebody found out this stuff. And uh, this, this particular um, example is, is well known. It's been known for over 100 years. But the reason why this, this acted so weird uh, was a little interesting discovery. If, uh, if this hadn't been found, I, I basically would have found one of the best known examples for, for this uh, famous unsolved problem. But it's, it was already known. I just found a weird way of getting to it. The Minkowski question mark function, Min, Minkowski also did Egyptian fractions early on to the five over n. Uh, Minkowski did a lot of work with continued fractions. Uh, the question mark function is a way of representing a value based on its continued fractions. So for example, the Minkowski question mark value for pi is this thing. And you'll notice that there's, there's a whole bunch of nines here. Well, that corresponds to the 292 in the continued fraction. A large term in the continued fraction means that the question mark function will have a lot of repeated nines or zeros. So if we look at, uh, we can do the split. It turns out there's 72 nines in a row for pi. And if you divide 292 by 72, you get about four. If we look at the, the fourth root of 9.1, we get 75,000. Well, if you do the Minkowski question mark uh, sequence, you'll get a number which has 22,770 zeros in a row before it starts 
continuing on past that. And if you divide those big numbers, you get there's about 3.3 um, zeros per value in the large term of the continued fraction. This is an unsolved problem. Uh, how many zeros are nines in the, are in the Minkowski question mark function based on the continued fraction? It's still not understood. And with all these things, we can finally do bad fraction simplification. So this number here, if we, um, if we just cross out the repeating part, we get 4 fifths. And it turns out that this fraction actually is 4 fifths. And it turns out that if you look at the value we're crossing out here, if we look at that as a repeating decimal, it's equivalent to the fraction four sevenths. So four fifths corresponds to four sevenths as a bad fraction. And uh, basically most, most fractions and numbers have a bad representation um, with, with simplification. Uh, and often it can be a very large number. So for, let's see if I can find a, a more reasonable size one. Oops. Here we go. Oh, that's a one seventh again. Okay. For example, seven sixteenths corresponds to this fraction, 28 over 171. And here's another one here. Um, uh, four seventeenths as a matching fraction of of sixty eight over two three eighty three, but you need to use this number to get the bad simplification. Uh, we've got uh, this is a demonstration on the in the demonstrations project, and I find it it uh, fascinating that there's this method for doing things badly involving. Uh, continued fractions, repeating decimals, and all this other nice stuff where you can set these things up uh, so that things work out nicely when they really shouldn't. We can, uh, we can also look at uh, what integer values multiplied by the sum of their reciprocals gives a given value. Uh, if we take say the value, um, oh, where's, uh, oops. if we take the number 59, what are the options for possible integers and fractions? So for example, with 59, 2, 15, 85 works. If you do um, 2 plus 15 plus 85 and multiply by 1 half over 115 plus one over 85, you get 59. So you can rewrite this as that, which can multiply out to get this long polynomial. And solving for x, you get this elliptic curve, which for the value 59 is solvable. It turns out that not all values are solvable. Uh, for example, uh, 58 is not solvable. 52, 51, or so 49, 50, and 51 are not solvable, but 49 and 52 both are. Once you have one solution, there's usually an infinite number of solutions. And I mentioned elliptic curves here. A property of elliptic curves is um, usually any line will go through three points or it'll be tangent to the curve at one point. And the, that point of tangency is considered as two values. So if, if uh, two points are given that are both rational, the property of elliptic curves is that the 
third point of intersection is also rational. And this is used in uh, cryptography and other applications. Uh, once you can set things up as an elliptic curve and you find some rational points, you can generate a whole bunch more rational points just by drawing lines. And each time you add a point, you'll usually be adding uh, many more lines. Uh, and um, once, you, once you start that process off, usually the points will uh, fall into different ranks. And whether there's a infinite number of, whether there's a limit on the number of ranks for a given elliptic curve is still an unsolved problem. I believe uh, Noam Elkies has the record for a curve with uh, 21 uh, different rational values for the possible ranks. Another place that fractions come up strangely is uh, in probabilities. Um, for example, the Sylvester four-point problem, what are the odds of all points in a given convex hole? So this is um, for, um, for um, um, a, a bounded rectangle. If you're given five points, the odds that a convex hole has all five points is 25 over 36. If you're bounded by a, a triangle, though, instead, The, the chance of, of all the points being on the, on the uh, convex hole is two thirds instead. So every time I click, there's a, a, there's a one third chance that there's going to be a red point. So that's Sylvester's problem. And, and if you do five points, the, the chance that all five will be green is only 11 out of 36. And if we go to the full, then uh, the chance of, of uh, all five is 49 over 144. There's uh, many things dealing with um, average uh, lengths and whether they, a particular type of triangle will, will turn up. Uh, if I remember right, if you take a, a, a 3D ball and just take two points inside, the chance that the, the average length of that line, I believe, is if you take the points as being um, uh, distributed normally is... 33 over 32, if I remember correctly. Uh, there's all sorts of strange probabilities that boil down to simple fractions. If you're given a number, is it possible to make a right triangle which has that area where all the sides are rational? It turns out that the, uh, the smallest area you can get is five. And here's a, a triangle that has area five. Here's uh, the next one up is area six, which is a simple three for five triangle. And here's the smallest for seven. If that area corresponds to a rational triangle, then it's called a congruent number. And the uh, whether a number is congruent or not is still an unsolved problem. So here's uh, they, they can get pretty pretty nasty quickly. So for example, um, let's see here. Here's uh, here's the solution for four thousand and six. And as we get uh, to larger values, you can get very difficult uh, fractions. They, they don't even show up on my screen any, anymore. 
And let's take a look at the code here. Uh, let's see. We'll uniconize this. Hope that doesn't crash anything. For 157, for example, the hypotenuse has this big fraction. These are solved up to 10,000, I believe. And these are very difficult to solve. Um, the general method for finding these is unknown. Here's another one. You have a, a unit square and you want to find a point so that the distances to the four corners is always rational. And this demonstration here has a whole bunch of uh, solutions where three values are rational. This is an unsolved problem. Uh, so for example, for this one here, this particular point at this location has these three rational distances and this irrational distance. If you put points into a bound region, uh, for example here, the locations of these points in this instance, uh, all of these points here turn out to be rational values. Uh, it's not always the case, for example, for this case, uh, everything is a, a strange root object. And here, they're not even, they're not even well-defined root objects, but for 16 points, everything is an exact fraction. And with the Heilbronn problem, you're basically looking for the largest possible smallest uh, triangle. So all these red triangles here have the same area. Those are the smallest triangles and these bigger ones, those are the bigger triangles. But uh, the Heilbronn problem is still mostly unsolved for anything above. Uh, in fact, I don't even think uh, 13 points has been solved yet. And that's the material I had prepared. Um, I'll be glad to answer any questions that people have about fractions and similar items. And I can also take requests for future uh, talks. Does anybody have any questions? Let's see here. And if anybody has any solutions to any of these, edp at wolframat.com. I'd be glad to take a look at anything you find. And also do feel free to send in new demonstrations. I'm always looking for nice new material, especially if it, if it is good at explaining something in mathematics uh, in a new way or in an old way. No, I think we can wrap this up. Many thanks for attending, and I'll see you in one month with another uh, in the in the um, in the series mathematical games. Many thanks.